today we're doing um, two Paradise songs. Well, maybe even we're, we're actually probably going to end up talking about three because we got to talk about Stevie too. But um, Gangsta's Paradise, um, Coolio, and um, Welcome to Paradise by Green Day. So that's that's where we're headed. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, it's always fun. Like this is a this is a uh, this uh this podcast this show is an unraveling. Mm-hmm. I think that would be the best word that if I could use like an adjective, yeah. to like describe what we do. It's like, well, we unravel things. It's like, you know, like even within ourselves and our own thought processes and some of our notions about the music that we hear, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. And I think, you know, and I don't know if you've noticed this from watching our episodes, one of the things that's striking to me is like, you know, our notes are similar oftentimes. Yeah, they're very similar. I mean, some of that is we grew up not in the same places, but I mean, some of the same places and um, like city, same places anyway. And we're the same age too. That's so we're, we're, we're coming to it with some of the same perspectives. I think, you know what? I do think that Charlotte Mecklenburg's uh, educational system has something to do with our ability to um, think critically though. Yeah. Because the, the, I, the, the, the Piedmont West Charlotte thing for me at least is, is one of those things that, I mean, they they did that explicitly, like how to do that. Like it was, it yeah. was a very, no, very, very concrete thing. I mean, you know, the AG West Charlotte thing is kind of like the same way. Mm-hmm. I mean, my principal Ann Clark at AG was named National Principal of the Year. She was my principal believe- at Shamrock Gardens in elementary school, actually. Yeah. Oh, really? So you yeah. know Miss Clark too? I have yeah, a I story. Do. You know, one day my mother got stuck at work at the hotel and couldn't even get to the phone, and I got stuck at school, and Miss Clark took me all the way home, like in her car. Yeah. And we talked she's the a cool whole lady. Time. She is. It's one of the nicest things anybody ever did for me. I believe she was our superintendent for a while. Yeah, she was. Or she, mm-hmm. she was. Yeah. I figure she had retired by now. But yeah. yeah. She is retired, but yeah. But she was a wonderful woman, a national teacher of the year. But but that um I just say that that um the educational level and the educational system in Charlotte Mecklenburg was the first time I got challenged, Andrew. I didn't get mm-hmm. challenged at all in Atlanta. I breezed through everything in the school system yeah. there. And so, like, meeting guys like you and um, Jeff Black, Justin yeah. Perry, uh, Nasif Gordon. Yep. You know, like, guys like y- y'all, it's like, oh, I hadn't seen y'all before. It was mm-hmm. like, ooh, but good times. But I think a lot of that is that school system. The school system is more wonderful than people give it credit for. Yeah. yeah. It, doesn't, it doesn't get enough credit at all. At all. Um, so. Where are you going to start? Um. I want to start with the fact that I really love Green Day. You know, next to Nirvana, <laughs> next to Nirvana, they're probably my favorite alternative band mm-hmm. outside of the hip hop and R and B realm from that area. I mean, in particular, it's like for me, like Nevermind and Dookie, and uh, No Doubt's Tragic Kingdom yeah. are probably my three favorite albums. And so, like, this is kind of like in the pocket of what yeah. I love because I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, isn't Green Day very um it's very parody and satirical driven and anti there's, there's a lot of sarcasm in it for sure. Yeah. Yes. There's a lot of, there's a lot of sarcasm and they aren't they anti-establishment? Don't they come yeah. off as so anti-establishment? Yeah, the, the, they come from the punk tradition, which is a very anti-establishment thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it feels anti-establishment and the songwriting is, um, I don't know. I, I want you to kind of, uh, maybe, maybe lead the conversation on what you're, you're hearing from the record, because just for me, you know, as a hip hop lover, I love the energy this record provides. Yeah. This feels like um, the the hip hop version of this would be like Public Enemy Live. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, Sutton B and Flavor and the whole squad and like and everybody and, and the whole like, NOI with them and all that. Yeah, yeah. this would be all right. the rock. So, so, so Green Day is like three people, right? So it's, I mean, they play with more people now, like in the modern world. But when they were coming up, there were just three people, just a guitarist slash vocalist billy joe armstrong and a bassist and a drummer so it's just it's, on welcome to paradise it's just three people making all that noise um it's and they come from the punk tradition um so like sex pistols ramones the clash i mean that kind of tradition um punk music generally speaking i don't want to go too far on the sidebar here but like we just to establish context um uh, the punk tradition um is intentionally anti-establishment i mean like that's the whole thing it's it's anti it's anarchist it's i mean it's that kind of tradition Mm -hmm. that comes from like the sex pistols and stuff like that in england um 
and them, them getting in big trouble for writing songs about the queen um and and yeah the flag and the whole deal um so they were anti that kind of establishment like the the royal family the powers that be the man right but they were also anti the self-aggrandizing like zeppelins the rushes the bostons um like the the one the bands in the mid 70s that would have the you know 10 minute guitar solos and the um like showing off their musicality um the punk the punk world is about um you don't have to be able to play the instruments well or sing well or whatever there's you're just making noise um and most of them are based on one or two chords maybe three um, this one, Welcome to Paradise, is three chords, um, or the main riff is, and that's a that's a pretty da dun 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 dun. Like that is a pretty typical punk riff. Um, so where Green Day diverges, though, um, which is why they I think became so famous, um, is they have more of a sense of melody than. Um, than any not made i don't know the punk world well enough to, to say definitively than any band that came before them any punk band that came before them but they're certainly an outlier in that sense you know i mean and i say this because you know obviously what is due to 93 92 i think it's four yeah yeah around that time i remember because of the time that they caught me mm -hmm. you know i followed them uh subsequently after dookie yeah. and I can't think of a band that comes from what you would say their world, the quote unquote punk world that has the ability or that I think their best ability might be their agility as a punk band while still keeping some of that punk rock aesthetic. Some of yep. that is songwriting, but the other part of it is the ability and the melodic nature. And I think what you hear on Dookie that makes it so great is that you hear that punk rock anti-establishment aesthetic, mm -hmm. but you also hear that they have some melody and harmony and songwriting skill too. They have also the there's in traditional punk music, you have people singing badly on purpose, shouting that kind of thing. Um, many of them probably could sing, but just weren't um, like the Ramones is, is I want to be sedated 20, 20, 24 hours ago. I want to be sedated. Okay. That's um, the most famous Clash song that everybody would know is Should I Stay or Should I Go? The one they play in commercials and everywhere. That's yes. the Clash. All right. Yes. Um, and so they, but but I don't know any other punk bands that could write um, Basket Case or Longview or those are those are like super melodic songs. And, and all of the musicians are gifted too, not just the guitarist and songwriter. And mm -hmm. most band punk bands before this are just playing the bass line is the same as the chords, basically just playing the root note of the chords. Mm -hmm. And, but, but Mike Durant's playing like some, some like funky stuff, you know, the, it's almost not quite the funk bassist, but I mean, he's got, there's like melody lines in the basses too. Melody. Yeah. Like, yeah. like in Longview, the do, 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 That's what I mean. Yeah. That's a different type of melody. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's not any other punk bands that could write like, the time of your life, which is later, um, of or is time of your life is our senior year of high school. So, because I remember it, them talking about that being that was one of the songs that was everybody's like senior okay. song or whatever. And okay. West Charlotte was cool enough to, have to do Prince's 1999, but like, um, the, but m mo many many senior class songs were. I hope you had the time of your life. Um, Boulevard of Broken Dreams. I mean, that's like th those are like super melodic. That's songs. the one. To, to mind is just like well you don't hear that from a rock punk band like at all like yeah. Boulevard Dreams yeah. like that's I mean uh, like almost it has a certain soul to it that almost makes you feel like somebody like Isaac Hayes yeah. or, or somebody of that stature from black music like it has that type of melodic tempo and feel to, mm -hmm. to it's you know? coming it's, it's, it's that one american idiot that album um is a rock opera of sorts like i mean it's a, it's a long story right you know this but maybe the people don't necessarily the so there's lots of songs on there that and, and doing a rock opera kind of thing like doing a one long piece essentially with all interconnected songs is a very not punk thing to do like it's not a thing that you would see a punk band do um so 
a lot of their some of their later stuff is actually like not anti-punk but like being anti-establishment anti like the group of people they came up with kind of too not and not in a bad way just like not in, intentionally not being confined by the the parameters that that kind of music sets up and generationally they were probably like taught that because they're like around you well they're older than us but you know generation yeah. but not a ton yeah yeah, not a ton. Of, that's where they come from. So uh, my, my next question to you is uh, outside of obvious the, the uh, fact that uh, these uh, songs, um, the actual names of these songs go together. Mm -hmm. What made you think of uh, Welcome to Paradise by Green Day um, with uh, Coolio's Gangsta's Paradise outside of time frame and song name? Is there anything in the uh, in, in the lyrics to, to Welcome yeah, to Yeah, like the I mean, my honest answer is that I didn't think as much about the lyrics before I made the thing, made the comparison, um, <laughs> because if you've heard, I know you've heard the song, but if the people have heard the song, like welcome to paradise, the lyrics are not super clear. Like, like he's not, oh. he's not enunciating super clearly. And that's not the point. Um, like I didn't know all the words to the song until I looked them up for doing this episode. And I've listened to the song a thousand times over the past 20 years or whatever. So um, I, you should, I should kind of sing along to the melody and not pay attention to the words, but um, Billy Joe Armstrong was uh, um, th they're a, like a Berkeley, Oakland kind of, they come from that in like North Cal um, place. And he was a, like a teenage runaway. So the, the story of American idiot, not to put too fine a point on it is, not an autobiographical story but sort of based on his life um but he was a teenage runaway at, at 16 he left home um then he went and moved in a warehouse with like i don't know how many other people a bunch of other people and lived in like the he uses the word slums in the song um the, the a really hard harsh neighborhood um with gun violence and drugs and everything else um from the time he was 16 and lived there with his bandmates and the band came out of that area. So um, both of the songs are also perspectives on pl harsh living kind of places. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought it was an interesting thing to talk about the comparisons between uh, how like white runaway kids um, they're living harsh in kind of a hard circumstance, um, sort of their own choosing. Like, I mean, obviously when you're run away at 16, you're running away from something that's not super pleasant, but it's as compared to the story that Coolio is telling of how his, I don't know if it's his world, but and we'll have to talk more about that later, but, um, about how that world normally operates. So they're talking about the same place, sort of, kind of. And talk, calling it paradise, both of them, too. So, <clears throat> I'd like you have been listening to Welcome to Paradise by Green Day for a long ass time. <laughs> yeah. Never really paid attention to nope. all of the words. He's not enunciating and, at all, so. <laughs> not enunciating at all. He's literally just like, I mean, what, what That's, that's a very it? punk thing, too, so. Right. And um, I was stunned, quite frankly, at how well the lyrics to these songs matched up. Yeah, and, and I was too. <laughs> yes, it's striking. And what I see and what I hear is the manifestation of the different perspectives that made us want to do this. And so let me kind of like delve into that a little bit. Yeah, please this, do. <clears throat> how do I say this? When I listen to this song, like while reading the lyrics and listening to it, because you need to like actually like read the lyrics and listen to it two or three times and read the lyrics and listen yeah. to it two or three times because it's happening fast. It's yeah. the energy of this song that kind of makes it what it is. And it's a great record. I've always loved it from the mm -hmm. first time I heard it. I loved it. Um, it almost makes you think as a black man, as a black man, you don't hear about black people running away from the ghetto or from the slums. Mm -hmm. and, and so it almost makes you think like running away has a form of white privilege to it. And listen to what I'm about to say, where a black person knows that if they were to run from the circumstances that they're in, 
there's just probably more dire circumstances waiting for them. Okay. I think part of white privilege is the belief that because you're white, that you can just like do literally what you want and move mm -hmm. from one situation to the next. And so although he's probably coming from an abusive home as a runaway, that's usually what makes most people run away, no matter what nationality or origin or yeah. ethnicity you claim. There's something about being white where that seems to happen more because mm -hmm. they think that there's something better out there and they're mm -hmm. not totally wrong for thinking that and yeah. that and there is some white privilege to that and it's in the names of the song because he can make a parody and a satire out of it called Welcome to Paradise, whereas in Coolio's case, the same hell that's being described mm -hmm. is actually called a gangster's paradise, almost like it's a good thing. Yep. Like, oh, no, 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 this is how gangsters live. Almost there's a um, there's a numbing complacency to the gangsters paradise side of it, where mm -hmm. there is a still more hopeful side to the welcome to paradise side mm -hmm. of it, because he's making a choice to run away. But he yeah. has that option. Right. Exactly. Listen, on Coolio's Gangster Paradise, he said, because I've been blasting so long that even my mama thinks exactly. that my mind is gone. So there's a numbness over there mm -hmm. that doesn't exist over here. That is some of the white privilege that comes into play. That is some of the juxtaposition. That is some of the core of what made us want to do this. It wasn't just to mm -hmm. unpack the differences in the music, yep. but how the music thereby impacts and affects the culture. I think this is arguably our best selection that exemplifies that. Mm. That's cool. No, the 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 other part to, to piggyback on what you said is that welcome to paradise was written like a, in that time too like when he was living in the warehouse so it was but it's also a new thing for him right it's a new and, and in coolio's world he's been living this life since he was like a little kid right like like since he was born essentially or in the narrative of the song um and in welcome to paradise the first verse is um, he's scared. Like he's been there three weeks and he doesn't know what he's doing. Right. Um, and then the last verse, he's been out there six months and he's like, this is freaking awesome. Right. Um, so there's, there's a, he's moved to a place that um, he even says it in the course. Some call it slum. Some call it nice. That is terrifying for him to start with. And it is a world that he becomes used to, um, to um, people doing drugs, to people getting shot outside his door, which is how the beginning of the second verse goes. Um, and he is, uh, when, once he's acclimated to this, he feels like he fits there in some kind of ways. I don't necessarily know if I totally agree with that, because here's okay. what I thought when I uh, found, when I was listening and heard the laughing mm -hmm. part. Well, he mm -hmm. starts off on the first verse talking about, do you hear me whining? Yeah. And now it's six months later, and it's like, do you hear me laughing? And the first thing I thought is, well, usually when you're in a rough situation, people say, well, you have to do what? Laugh. Have to keep from keep crying. crying. And mm -hmm. so when he's saying that he's laughing, I don't think that it's better. I think he's actually in a worse mental state. And that would coincide with more of the themes of how he writes his music. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, I never thought about it like that. But yeah, he's... Like something's cracked almost because the yeah. second verse is talks about the urchins cracking. Like I believe he uses that word, right? Or something I, very much like that. And let me submit something to you. And this is what I mean about where I can see like, <clears throat> okay, so listen to what I'm about to say. How old was he when he wrote this? He was probably about 16 or 17. He was 16 or 17 when he ran away. So he's talking about that time when he was that age. Uh, there's a shock that this is what I mean about like, there is some socioeconomics and some of the uh, uh, privilege involved. Mm hmm. Okay, see, some of the shock value in this is that he's not accustomed to this environment. Right. You get what I'm saying? So he's not getting exposed to this environment until he's 16, 17 years old. Right. So let me say this to you. If you were to juxtapose that to black, the black cultural side of things, this is something an eight-year-old would write. Okay. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And so there's a gap even generationally, socioeconomically in terms of being exposed to this type of upbringing because... This wouldn't be the words of a 16 or 17 year old black man coming from the slums because right. he's already, he, quite frankly, just inundated in a certain way about certain things that he wouldn't speak with this shock value. Like, right. oh, somebody 
I got shot. It's like, oh shit, somebody else I get shot every day. Police getting shot. My friend just got his eye shot out. My brother got his eye shot. Out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. That's Illmatic, right? That's a 17 year old writing about it. Right. It's a 17 year old writing about the experiences that they've seen at seven, eight, yeah. nine. Right. Correct. So this is different, but I think that's what I mean. Some of that is the socioeconomics and the choice of being exposed to that world. Because, right. you know, you can tell from the shock value, it's like, well, you're coming from an abusive home, but not an abusive area. Or you wouldn't be as shocked by the things that you're seeing or going through. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I thought it was wonderful. And it, and it, it was so funny. I've been listening to this song since I was like, since we were kids. And it's like, yeah. I never really like paid attention. And I was like, wow. Yeah. 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 He's, he's, he's giving a different group of people and a little insight into what that world looks like, at least through his eyes. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, um, but also too, I think this is where, I mean, for those who were paying attention to these lyrics, I think this has something to do with their following. Mm-hmm. You feel me? Because there are probably a lot of other white teens mm-hmm. who felt the same way. And so I think he spoke to a populace that wasn't being spoken for. And usually when you do that, you have tipping points. And so that's yeah. why they are a tipping point band is like a punk rock uh uh I mean, I even felt like some of their early stuff kind of sounds skyish, kind of, didn't it? A little bit, yeah. I mean, they have—he has that tone in his voice a little bit, I and mean, that's that's more yeah. no doubt ish. But like, yeah, definitely more no doubt ish. But I felt like there was still, yeah. I mean, that's a whole nother conversation anyway. But they, but, but, but I think stuff like this, especially when we unpack it and see for what it's worth, it's like, oh, that's what makes them different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and they were one of the ones that set off the whole. I mean, the Blink 182s and Fallout Boys. I mean, like all of those bands. Yeah. I mean, yes. co- not co- they're either pulling from the same influences or pulling from Green Day. Like, and even like later Weezer songs are pulling from like Green Day too. Not the oh. original ones because their original stuff was the same time as, as Green Day's. But like, um, this is not a Weezer episode though. We'll have to get into them at some point too. But yeah, Green Day's just more culturally impactful than Weezer. Yeah. They, they've been doing it a really, really long time. And, they're one of the only bands we we talked about this with with Nirvana too um because they didn't survive um past 94 but they're one of the only bands from that time period Pearl Jam's another one that have have survived this that amount of time like and that's well, I mean, not an easy thing to do well you want to know what i mean you're actually talking about the bands though that i think made the best music mhm like think about their best albums where their best albums are like the albums of that time. So if you look at most of the bands that survived, like, you know, that didn't have anything like tragic happening to singers. Right. Or, yeah. It's like, we'll go look at their work. That's why, like, you can always go back to the work mm-hmm. usually and see. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause when I think of Pearl Jam, I'm like, well, yeah, they, their work kind of stands like, cause yeah. when it, cause I have some of their stuff and when it comes up randomly, I'm like, Oh yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, no, no. You you can listen to ten and versus and Vitology, like the early albums. I mean, all of their albums are pretty good, but like the you listen to their early albums and that stuff that stuff still holds up. And you can still listen to Dookie and you can still listen to um, Nimrod, which is the album with um, with the Time of Your Life song on it, which was late nineties. And um, American Idiot still holds up too. American Idiot's not is 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 what ten years old now at least. I mean, it's long, it might be older than that. Oh, no, it's older than that now. Um, I don't know. No, because yeah, it was because it's close to fifteen now, probably because yeah. it was it was like the George Bush years. It was yeah. that was what he was writing about. So yeah, he um, was. So yeah, close twenty years. It feels like it's he's got there's and then there's not many bands to kind of put a put a bow on this like that. Um, have that much good music that far apart too and that's that's not dissimilar to like what you were arguing about Nas. uh why, why, one of the reasons why he's one of the he is the greatest mc according in according to hip-hop world is is that not only is he a great great artist but he's made great things many 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 years apart and has been consistently good over a long period of time too yeah i mean when you when you're making some of your best work and it's literally like 
when you're closer to being like when you've been at it for almost 30 years and mm -hmm. you make some of your best stuff as you like approach 30 years at doing something. I yeah. mean, think about what that's saying. Like, think about what we say about LeBron 20 mm -hmm. years into basketball, Tom Brady 23 years in the football. This guy is like in year number 29 of MC mm -hmm. and just got done having one of the best years of his career yeah. last year. You know what I mean? So it's really yeah. unheard of. The same way Tom Brady is unheard of. The same way LeBron is unheard of. And so his uh, so think about who we're talking about. Like like LeBron on a bad day is the third or fourth greatest player who ever lived. Right. Like on a bad day, Tom Brady. If you really want to like parse it out and maybe say Lawrence Taylor is second on the worst day. So like that's kind of who Nas's like comps are. You know yeah. what I mean? So he's like easy top three and probably number one you know yeah yeah, yeah. Like, and and the to come back to green day for a second too like the doing the that kind of music at that age too like this is not like slow jam <laughs> this is like high energy um three chord rock and roll so it's like i mean not all of it is i mean obviously some of their more recent stuff is um more melodic but but still they still have modern contemporary songs that are also very like welcome to paradise very punky um yes. so i like very punky yeah you want to know what i did have a quick sidebar note yeah sure please do we got like seven minutes it's fine oh we do yeah, yeah yeah well let me sidebar yeah yeah let, let me do the sidebar right now right quick so when i was on according to hip-hop i was actually talking about the beatles a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. And was talking about their place as the greatest band ever. And Mike kind of fired back at me. Was like, he's like, well, I don't know about the greatest ever. He's like, what about Earth, Wind, and Fire? What about the Eisenberg? As soon as he said Earth, Wind, and Fire, I was like, no. And I and I meant that not because like I didn't think the quality of songs was there. I don't know if the depth is there because Earth, Wind, and Fire really only made about, I think, five albums together. Mm -hmm. you I mean, know Earth, Wind, and Fire is great, but like, yeah. And I and I and, and to be honest with you, of those five albums, I only think three of them, if memory serves, is really, really great. Like mm -hmm. high level where I would like feel comfortable throwing it at the Beatles. All and I could pick music from the other albums that yeah. are not level. But I've been on a little Isley Brothers kick last night and this morning. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, I do think that the Isley Brothers have the music. And the impact culturally to stand right next to the Beatles. Because one thing that I thought about, I was like, well, first of all, you, you, I mean, this is what you have to think about. Well, the Isley Brothers are the originators of Shout. Okay. You know, you make me want to shout. Take yeah. my hand. That's the Isley Brothers. Okay. You know, and then, <clears throat> I mean, we can get into the records, but then you have to think about the cultural impact. Because when I mean every R&B and hip hop artist is used the Isley Brothers, most notably, I think, in the hip hop spectrum, Ice Cube taking footsteps in the dark mm -hmm. and turning it into "It Was a Good Day," yep. and so it's literally taking one of our most classic um, R and B records and mm -hmm. turning it into one of our most classic hip hop records. But they have uh, proverbial footprints in the sand all over black music, much like the Beatles, and actually, song for song. They have some pretty big hits that can stand right there. And you have to understand, very talented band as well. Like, um, mm -hmm. and not I forget Stephen, I forget his name. Stephen Isley's daughter, Alex Isley, is an artist now. She's very, very gifted and dope. But I thought um, after doing some digging, the Isley Brothers for me would be actually band-wise the biggest comp for the Beatles. Okay. Like, because, that's, that's an interesting sidebar because the Isley Brothers... They have everything that the Beatles have. They have the they have the intricate but soft and simple songwriting, like "For the Love of You," "Footsteps in the Dark," "Shout." They're not overcomplicated, just like John and Paul aren't overcomplicated. It's a full band that can play everything, just like the Beatles. The hits are big. The cultural impact is there. And so when I thought about it, it's like the Isley Brothers are the closest comp for the Beatles, actually. They have all the things that the Beatles had, including even that style of songwriting, which I think is just part of that time. Yeah, it's the sixties. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's what I mean. The Isleys mm -hmm. may even. I'm not sure when the Beatles became actual band, but I think the Isleys perceived the Beatles as a band a little bit too. They they became a band in 1960 or 61, probably. Yeah, I think I think the Isleys are like 58, Andrew. Yeah. I mean, John um, and Paul. John and Paul would have been playing together before that, but like, 
Like as, a, as like a band band. Yeah. As the Beatles. That's what I'm saying. I think the Isleys became the Isleys in like 1957, 1958 or something like that. Because I think that's where Shout comes from. Okay. And so it's just something to think about. And and I was actually thinking, I was like, we may have to forge a conversation one day and maybe have like a Beatles Isley Brothers show where we talk about mm. some of their records and what make the records. What not exactly are. a versus, but that kind of. No, no I mean, I, a, I think. In like I'm, I'm not as familiar with the Isley Brothers. I mean, I know who they are, obviously, and I've known the songs that you've named. But like, yeah, is, the interesting thing about that is that I grew up primarily listening, like as a little kid, not as a like a teenager, but listening to 1980s country music with my dad on the radio, and my mom played like the the oldies station, so so lots of Motown kind of songs, but. The Isley Brothers were not a band that was played there. I mean, the shout was, but like most of the other songs, "Put Steps in the Dark," those kind of songs were not really played on the radio alongside like Diana Ross and the Temptations and that kind of stuff. Yeah, see, see they they were more. So, uh, so it's it's interesting for me. I, I want to hear more about this, but like, it's interesting for me because this is not a thing that they're not a band that I know a ton about, and I. So my inclination is to say no, they're not as big as the Beatles, but like also like i don't know enough to say that so like the the cultural impact thing is the part that that stuck out to me from what you just said because we've talked about this before like from the beatles like everything that has come after that is taken from in the white world is taken from the beatles and and then that's the same thing you're saying that the isley brothers did yes that's and, and it took me a while to think about it here's another thing think about it too um What's the record? Between the Sheets. Mm. That's what. That's Biggie, Big Papa. So think about Big Papa and A Good Day. Like those are both Isley Brothers samples, and it's down the line. R. Kelly, like like you name it, you can go down the lineage of black music pretty much from when they started, and everybody has borrowed from the Isleys on the black side of music and on the soul side of music the same way everybody in popular and rock music has taken from the Beatles, and so the Isley Brothers. Green Day, actually. The Isley Brothers are probably our Beatles and Earth, Wind, and Fire are probably our Rolling Stones. That makes exactly. sense. I'll, I'll, I'll take that. And so, I mean, <clears throat> like, people understand, and this is what I mean, like, for black music, this is just some of the stuff, like, For the Love of You, Between the Sheets, Footsteps in the Dark, Shout, Voyage to Atlantis. That's one of their best records. Uh, Groove With You, Make Me Say It Again. Who's that lady? That's the Isley brother. Who's that lady? I know that one. Yeah, yeah that's the Isley brothers. That's what I'm saying. Think about how many commercials that's been a part of. Mm-hmm. You know, Choosy Lover, which Aaliyah redid. Mm-hmm. So they, yeah, they've got stuff everywhere, man. Very much like Summer Breeze. Summer Breeze makes I, I, me the Isley yeah. brothers. I didn't know don't, that was Isley's too. Don't like, say goodnight till it's gone. Yeah. Don't say goodnight. Just go into the Beatles catalog. Yeah, hello, it's me. Hello, hello. That's all. That's all the Isley Brothers. Like mm-hmm. they, have, you. It's very much like the Beatles in the sense that if you're not familiar, you're more familiar when you realize when you actually start playing the songs. Yeah, it's like, like, oh, no, like two thirds of those songs that you just named, I'm not like pulling up the song in my head as you said the name of the song. But if I heard the song, I'd be like, oh, oh yeah, of course. So. Uh, some of those songs that I've named, you've heard, you just didn't know it was them. Right. Them. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't know Summer Breeze was the Isley Brothers, for example. Right. So that's a beautiful right. fucking song. Like, yeah, that's what I mean. Song. They have a whole catalog full of records like that, and they've been just around as long as the Beatles. So they would be look. Just go listen to their music, and we'll talk about it. No, actually, as a to make that what we just talked about not a sidebar, um, an interesting connection there about my ignorance of of black music um is that i didn't know that gangsta's paradise was a spinoff of stevie wonder song until i was like 35 probably like really? i didn't grow up with um i mean i listened to stevie wonder like i told you like with my mom on the radio or whatever so i knew you know my sharia more and higher ground and superstition i mean like the huge hits or whatever but the we didn't spend you know sunday listening to hotter in july or uh, or hotter than July, or songs in the key of life, or whatever inner visions, or that kind of thing. So, I was, I, I remember doing it because I remember like I'd heard, I'd heard pieces, I, and obviously many of the songs on songs in the key of life. But the 
so I decided one day I was just going to play it like all the way through just because it's like an iconic album, one of the greatest of all time that I see on all these lists or whatever. Uh, and then it started that, that synth riff. Dun, 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 dun. I was like, wait, that's. Mm-hmm. And I looked at the name and it said Pastime Paradise. I was like, okay, so this is, they, they took that song, maybe not entirely from CB Wonder, but like three fourths of it from CB Wonder. The, the, the melody lines, the t- the two hooks, the the synth riff, the are all taken from that song. Now, here's the cool thing about Stevie. Stevie was okay with it because mm-hmm. Stevie's always been wanting uh, to push our culture forward and black mm-hmm. culture, and has been one. He, he, you know, part of why he and Prince I, I idolize them musically so much is because they were always very endearing to those that came after them, mm-hmm. whom they felt were respectable enough to take stuff on. Like, um, you know, Stevie let Donnell Jones redo uh, Knocks Me Off My Feet, with also, which also comes off the song. Like, so many so many songs just off the songs in the key of life have been borrowed yeah. or yeah. taken from. Like, That's a like, great song, man. <sighs> yeah. I mean, Knocks Me Off My Feet might be my favorite Stevie Wonder song. Love it. Love it. Yeah. It might be. I mean, I think Stevie Wonder's song for song is better than anybody. I think Prince is the best artist who ever lived, but if we're talking songs, I think Stevie Wonder is better than the Beatles, Isley Brothers, Prince, Michael Jackson, like Bob Marley, like Bob Dylan, like you name it, pick anybody. Like, his, like his I, I, I don't know that I can argue with that. Like, I don't know that. I mean, we, I we, could, can, we can have that conversation on a different episode, but like that's reflexively that's, like there are, there are not many people that I would put like alongside John and Paul, like as like as a reasonable conversation. Like this, that, and that's a conversation. And and Stevie Wonder, like I I can't I can't argue with that. Like that's not. Here's what I'll tell you. Okay, so as songwriters, all comparable. I would put Prince in, in their stratosphere as a songwriter too, although more eccentric songwriter. Yeah. Like his, his songwriting is more original than all of theirs, but it's yeah. also more challenging and more daring intentionally i think too because he's pushing the envelope a little bit but in stevie's case I, I, the, here's the best way i can explain it i've heard a lot of beatles records and i'm like man the record is beautiful there are stevie wonder songs and you'll find them especially on his like classic run of albums his 70s albums mm-hmm. run there's there are songs on those albums that literally make you want to cry. They're so beautiful. And yeah. that's what, that, where I would place him above anybody is because even if the songwriting is comparable, I think vocally and the emotions and yeah. the intent, and he and I can't lie, he has an advantage. He can't see. So he's making you feel something different. Right. It literally makes you want to cry sometimes. It's so beautiful what he's yeah. writing. He is... He he does have, as far as I'm concerned, the most difficult songs to sing, um, of any of any musician. Like the the intervals between notes and where he's jumping between. Like, I can't, I can't. Like, and I, I used to be a reasonably good singer, and I I can't. I love Stevie Wonder so much, and I wish I could sing like that. But there's, but the list of people that can sing like that are is a very very short one. So it's I'm not like embarrassed by it. But but no, his songs are. Like I'm just thinking through the intervals of knocks me off my feet, like the way the notes are connected to each other. That's that's insane. It's I think if God came down and have a voice, that's what he would sound like. Yeah, I, I can't I can't argue with that. Like I, I don't um That's that's how I really feel about his voice. And and we cover this a lot on according to hip hop, and it matters on this side too. Voice matters. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And he might have the most original one ever. I, I love Stevie Wonder's voice. I mean yeah. It's it's a it's a one of one type of voice. Not saying it's the strongest. Not saying it's the best. Not saying the most octaves, but something about how it sounds. It touch. It, it goes like straight in here. Like that's what I mean. That's what that's what you know. That's what the word is supposed to do. That's what I mean. It's piercing. It's mm-hmm. God had. A, I mean, if, if God came down, He wouldn't be coming to move around you. He'd be coming to move through you. That's what mm-hmm. I mean. It's piercing. Like you know, God had a voice. That's what, okay. that's my yeah. take. And so to say that into um so this so Gangsters Paradise is coming out, you know what, maybe 17, 18 years after Pastime Paradise has been released. So in black lexicon and culture, we know this riff immediately. As soon as right. it comes in, oh, it's like, oh well, we know. And so yeah. there was a little controversy with them taking, like, you know, 
taking from Stevie and turning it into a gangster rap song mm -hmm. is touchy for black people. Okay. Like that's Stevie. You don't do that. Cause like here's the thing that black people feel about Stevie. Well, because of the style of music that he consistently chose to make, the populace knew about him but never got a hold of him the way Michael Jackson and Prince kind okay. of left our sphere into a sphere that everybody just like had a hold of them. Okay. Well, just like you're saying you didn't grow up listening to Hotter Than July and songs in the key. Like, oh, we all did that. Was I, I'm sure I knew that. Like I knew you did. Like I'm no getting so around that shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so he's more special to the black, like like Prince and Michael Jackson are special to everybody. Okay. Stevie is special, special to the black community. And so Julio taking the song was a thing for a minute. Mm -hmm. But, you know, not an unsavvy business move because I do believe him taking a Stevie Wonder song is what got him a Grammy for this song. Because yeah. I've always told you, I do not, Love this record, right? But it does, and, and, and God rest Coolio, you know, yeah. rest in peace. Part of the reason why we're doing this record is to pay him some homage for obviously his uh, mm -hmm. biggest record and song. But I mean, this song was everywhere, yeah, it, it was in TV jams, it was on Rap City's top 10, it, it was on every video station countdown show and network. Now, a lot of that had to do with the fact that it accompanied the soundtrack. Right. It was in. Um, and the star of the movie at the time was Michelle Michael Dangerous Pine. Minds. Michelle, just Dangerous Minds. Thank you. It's Michelle Dangerous Pine. Pine. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I don't know if today's generation remembers Michelle Pfeiffer, but I know you and I do. Just uh, putting. Especially Michelle, that generation. <laughs> right. Just Michelle putting, Pfeiffer. like, for our generation, just put saying Michelle Pfeiffer uh, was starring in a movie was going to get everybody's attention. Mm hmm. OK, and so he kind of had that on his side with it being the theme song accompanying a movie. Right. And, and for those of you who don't know the Dangerous Minds story, like the, the movie, it's, it's about a white teacher that goes into the inner city and is like saving these kids or not saving. You know what I mean? Like getting yeah. into their life. So it's it's a it's a stand and deliver kind of movie, except with a white person as a yeah. as, as the I, teacher I, person. I actually think it's just stand and deliver with a white girl. But I mean, that's why I just, yeah, like, <laughs> no, 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 it is. It's the same story. <laughs> but it was Michelle Pfeiffer. So yeah, it's like, exactly. Okay, I'm at least going to watch So that's <laughs> one of those like crossover moments. That's one of the reasons, like you said, that the song crossed so many yeah. things is because it accompanied that. And the imagery well, this, in the video was also from that movie, too. Well, which... this is where I mean it kind of worked in cross uh, reference, uh, cultural cross reference point. Well, Michelle Pfeiffer was already connected to the black community forever because she is Tony Montana's girlfriend in Scarface. Oh, I'd forgotten about that. In black lexicon, that's why we know and love Michelle Pfeiffer. So seeing Coolio doing the song, Michelle, see, Michelle Pfeiffer is one of those white girls that in 1995 is known in the black community because she's the white girl from Scarface. Okay. Like literally rap videos, there have been girls that have been dressed up to imitate Michelle Pfeiffer's character. I'm in rap watch today. It's good. Yeah. Like the world is yours by Nas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like like the Michelle Pfeiffer impersonation of her of, of the character she played in Scarface is big in black culture. Mm -hmm. So she's already kind of big to us. That's what I mean. It's just no, it's not just the white guys watching Michelle Pfeiffer in 1995 on Dangerous Minds. We're watching her too. And so Coolio kind of coming with that. Well, they got the black market with that because it was a movie about the inner city black kids. And mm -hmm. they had Coolio, who is a black man from the West Side inner city. And we knew Michelle Pfeiffer from Scarface. So it all made sense in the black community. So like the marketing, yeah, the, at least as far as affecting on the black community side, oh, genius. And, and then you take that and you add a Stevie Wonder song to it or whatever, or pull it from a Stevie Wonder song. And you can't and, lose. Yeah, that's, that's a beautiful, it's a good can't connection. Lose. And it's a, it's, a, it's a good moment. No, I mean, it is one of those moments where you can say, song making, branding, marketing, and culture all came together and kind of worked and made sense. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not a bad job. It's actually a job well done. And so I don't love this record. And I'll just say this because this record in your community got kicked like a street record. And for us, we're like, those aren't the street records we're listening to in 1995. Mm -hmm. Because, and, and here's what I want you to understand. And you know this now. Well, think about this. Shook Ones Part 2 by Mom Deep was coming out in 1995. You know, mm -hmm. um, Incarcerated Scarfaces by Raekwon is yeah. coming out in 1995. 
Brooklyn Zoo by Old Dirty Bastard is coming out in 1995. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, what? Uh, Biggie Smalls on the uh, One More Chance remix is coming out in 1995. These are the type of hip hop records that we're listening to. And if we're listening to hard stuff, we're not listening to Gangsta's Paradise. So that was my problem with the record. Yeah at the time is because I, and I still feel this way about it, even though I've just grown and just become more mature and just learned to accept some things about how economics and how branded it yep. works. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, this song got pushed because it was a safe street rap record. I'm listening to all the unsafe things at the time. And so I can see why this record got pushed, but here's what I'm going to submit to you. Coolio was never the dopest lyricist or MC. And okay. this was around the time that lyrics were really big. You know, lyrics are big in 1995 in hip hop if you're making street anthems and street records. And so what made this record was the simplicity, but the simplicity was intentional. And that's what I mean. I can look yeah. back on it. I don't know how to knock him for that now looking back on it. Because that was the intent. Right. They're telling we need a not that Not that he's un incapable of doing the other doing it the other way, but like this is what he was doing on purpose to cross over. The reasons, like this is, I told you this when I suggested this um, to start with. Um, that this is one of the first hip hop songs I was like fully aware of that I could do, like the the songs that crossed over or were like big big cultural whatevers in the early '90s um, that everybody, no matter who you were, knew were um, the Fresh Prince theme song and Ice Ice Baby, you know, which is terrible, but like it it was one of those songs that everybody knew, um, and some of the MC Hammer songs and and this. Like this was one of the one of the biggest white world crossover songs, um, and and that is because of the melody. Like like I didn't have to know that this was a Stevie Wonder song to appreciate the melodies in there. I um, mean, there's biblical references. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff in there that are like. I mean, the the opening line is "I walk through the valley of the shadow of death." Like it's 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 taking yes. oh. stuff that's very not popular is not the word but like well it's known safe. it's safe that's what yeah. i mean about it being safe and so it's like well hip-hop is in an unsafe time around that time mm -hmm. like it's challenging it's, it's a lot of shock value stuff going on even you have to understand let's go to 1995 in the south well that's when goody mob soul food is coming out so think right. about records like dirty south and cell mm -hmm. you know what i mean yeah. like it's dark yeah it's dark it's dense it's intelligent it's challenging Who's that peeking in my window? Pat, nobody now. Like, that's different than yeah. been standing lost in life, living in, you know, and taking Stevie stuff like that. So it was safe intentionally, but also thought about it too. Coolio did a good job. Like, this is a great example of the machine asking an artist to make a record and then actually making the record that works and makes sense for it. And people have to understand this too. Julio's actually from the streets, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's one of those things where it's like, well, don't think Julio is soft because he made this safe record. Julio actually used to bang and used to be out in the streets more than a lot of guys who talk about it. And so it's one of those things where it's like, well, you know, keeping it real ain't always keeping it right. He kind of kept it right and made a really, really big record that financially probably changed things for him. Yep. Yeah. 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 What are your some of, some of your thoughts about the record outside of it being like one of those first uh, uh, rap songs that you knew from beginning to end? Like, what do you think about the lyrical content? And like the things I, I, I think my experience of it is not super dissimilar to what you the kind of arc that you just described, like the way I interacted it with it, interacted it. Wow. Interacted with it as a teenager is different than I hear it now. Like I have, because of listening to according to hip hop, because of doing the show with you, I have much more of an understanding of what good lyrics are and like the intricacies of like high, high end um, lyricism. We talked about one of those in the last episode, actually um, the, and I can hear that the, the way that this is put together is much simpler. Mm -hmm. like and, and again not in a bad way just it is like i can rap along to gangsters paradise like i can do that right okay. and it's much simpler like i can't do the the riff from snoop's 
like dog like you, you do that all the time but like i can't do that i can't there's so many of the more intricate ones that i have i can't do and this one i can do like so so it makes it like feel like it includes me more i guess right like like murder was the case is still playing by snoop dog on the west coast yeah where and so you know so this is what i mean so rhyme wise you'll hear stuff like what what does snoop say nigga stay as i enter the center they send me two yards. Late night, that's where I stay. Late night, I hear toothbrushes scraping on the floor. Niggas getting their shanks just in case the war pops off. That's the West Coast stuff you're used mm -hmm. to hearing. And you're used to hearing him flip words like, oh, I know them niggas from the other side recognize my face because it's the OG, D O double G, L B C. Mad yeah. dog. It's because I don't care. Red jumpsuit with two braids in my hair. Yeah, that's the West Coast talk in 95. And the style wise, mm -hmm. what's right. going on. Coolio is literally intentionally, <clears throat> intentionally making a rap record mm -hmm. that is supposed to fit into a top 40 white man's playlist yep. in terms of what he can digest and listen to and enjoy. That was the intention. He was selected to do that because he had made Fantastic Voyage, which mm -hmm. actually samples, um, samples the song by a group called Lakeside. Okay. Lakeside very popular song back in, I want to say, 78, 79, might, mm -hmm. maybe sooner than that. Might have even been like 82, called Fantastic Voyage, and that became a big summer That's time. a slide, slide, slippity slide song, right? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and so he remade that, and it became a big time safe summer anthem, and so he was somebody chosen by the label because he had already made a safe summertime anthem before. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so none of these things were accidental. And that's what I mean. As like a hip hop purist and a guy who loved lyrics in this dark, gritty, and most lyrical time, I was like, mm -hmm. man, fuck some Coolio's gangsters <laughs> parody. But I can look back upon it now as a grown man. And it's like, oh, well, that was another grown man being asked to do a job. And yeah. as far as getting jobs done is concerned, for what you're asked to ask you, it's like, well, make us a top 40 playlist rap song. It's like, well, he did that. It went to number one on the rap charts. It won a Grammy. It was any and everywhere. So he did his job. He, like, he did what you asked him to do, or he did, he did what it. he was trying to do and get his money. When you, right. go, when you go to work and your boss asks you to do a job, you know, this is what I'm yeah. saying. When right. At 14 years old, I didn't understand that. Yeah. But at 41, that's, I that's the That's the punk ethos, right? That That's the reason a Green Day, you know, hits us at, at 14 or whatever is that, that you're like, no, screw the man. Right. Like, like that kind of, I'm not going to do that. That's the same reason we had the, you know, picture in the West Charlotte yearbook with all of us wearing hats. It's the same, it's the same ethos. Like you can tell me what to do. It's, it's that kind of teenage, whatever. And yeah. you, you tend to think of it in a, a softer way as you get older. You do. I mean, I, I don't even know if it's thinking about it in a softer way. I think you just have perspective differently because you've been through some things. You've been taken through the mud a little bit by life. Yeah. And you look back on things that maybe you weren't a fan of and being like, oh, well, you know, I'm still not that. Like, how about this? I'm still not a fan of the song. I still mm -hmm. don't play the song, but my appreciation and respect is different. And I right. think that's, that, that's what I was trying to say. I didn't say it very well, but yeah. I think you said it fine, but the appreciation and the respect level is different, even though it's still not my shit. Like if I'm going back to 1995, I'm still about to play incarcerated Scarfaces and give mm -hmm. up the goods by mom deep and Nas's verse from I four and I and Biggie on the get money remix and Andre's verse on thought process and CeeLo on goodie bag off of soul food. Like, no, I'm still going to play all that shit from 1995 and not play this, but I respect what that man did in 1995. Yeah way more than i did you know you know and it's funny 14 flip it it's 41 that's how old i was yep. as opposed to then and now you just flip those numbers around and it'll change your perspective about everything yeah yeah, yeah. i don't so, i don't have a ton else about this like i i loved i love the song then it's not something like i said that i listen to as much now because i mean I mean, I've, like you said, we listened to it on MTV and every version of MTV, everything and VH1. And it was everywhere at that point. So, um, yeah, it, it, it was in, in that world, in the 1995 world, it was harder to avoid things unless you like bought albums and stuff like that. Um, right. So this is what I mean. OK, so <clears throat> Stevie Wonder has a run. Of albums. I mean, Stevie's catalog starts in 1962. Mm -hmm. 
You know what I'm saying? Like that's like a, a jazz album, like the uh, first real album he released. It's like dedicated to uh, Ray Charles, to my uncle Ray. It was his biggest inspiration, obviously. You know, but um, right. And people have to understand Stevie has like what I like to call that early formulated like Motown stuff. Right. But 1969, Andrew, he pops up and makes uh, my share me sh- my share of more, mm-hmm. um, the shadow of your smile, and I forget. There's another song on here that's like really popular, but it's the shadow of my smile and my share of more, and it's like. It's like you have to understand this is 1969. It's like the most like beautifully different record that you're hearing at the time. Mm-hmm. So my sheer, so that's 1969. And although that album's not that great, my Sherry or more is on there. And right after that is the start of what I think is the best album run in history, which is it comes out with Signs Still Delivered in 1970. Where I'm coming from in 1971, which are both good projects. But then the classic stuff starts. Talking Book, 1972. Some of the stuff on Talking Book is You're the Sunshine of My Life. Mm-hmm. That's when I he had the, I love that song, man. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with You and I. That's one of those love songs mm-hmm. that I'm talking about brings it to, your, to tears. Superstition is on Talking Book. Okay, so that's the first great, great one, in my opinion. Like, where it's like, oh no, that's a classic album. The next year is Inner Visions with mm-hmm. Living for the City, Higher Ground, Don't You Worry About a Thing. I love that song. That's one of my very favorite ones. Well, first of all, I want you to know, like, he won Grammy for Album of the Year for both of these albums. And he did the same thing in 1974, the third straight year he won Album of the Year for, for Fullness First Finale, which, uh, it probably doesn't have songs people remember, but it probably has its best song right. Uh, you haven't done nothing. They won't go when I go. Heaven is ten zillion light years away. That's another one of those beautiful, beautiful love songs. Like tear, there's tear jerking stuff on fulfillment. Um, 1976 is the double album of songs in the key of life. I mean, which I'm pretty certain you're familiar with. Yes. Knox, Pastime Paradise. Isn't she lovely? Uh, as you know, there people are still playing all these songs at wedding. 1979 is Journey Through the Secret Life of Plants, which is probably some of his um, best songwriting, too, but least notable. And then it ends with Hotter Than July, which has Rocket Love, All I Do, Master Blaster, which was a Bob Marley-inspired song that he did lately, which Jodeci actually ended up mm-hmm. uh, taking. And so for me, that's the best album run ever is him from 70 to 80. Those one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight albums, Mm -hmm. much like we talked about the Beatles run. Like Mm -hmm. he has albums before and after, but those eight albums in that 10 year framework, I think is better than like anything, like song for song. It may not have all the hits, Mm -hmm. but I'm talking about the song and the songwriting and the music and the musicality. Yeah. And it transitions like generations too, like generationally. So he has stuff like My Sherry Amore in 1969, but he has stuff like Rocket Love in 1980. Like he's literally still making mm-hmm. brilliant, brilliant like love songs, like 11, 12 years from like his first brilliant one. And so mm-hmm. it's a pretty nice stretch of music just to kind of end it because Gangsta's Paradise is a Stevie Wonder inspired right. song borrowed pretty much from the hook to the no, I mean, the, the hook, hook is the same as yeah the hook is the same and the riff is the same so that's right. the basis of what made that song uh, yeah. a cult favorite or a fan favorite in stevie's catalog anyway so it's, it's, it's been really interesting to hear like it was one of the things that i wrote on here um on my notes was and you've already explained it so i didn't bring it up is that i've inferred from talking to you to, uh, that um, that Coolio is not very high up on the list of um, greatest MCs or greatest um, what that's res- he's not respected and revered in the hip hop world in the same way as many of the other people that we've discussed. Like even yeah. the ones you listed earlier, Raekwon and um, he's probably the least Nazi. revered person that we've covered actually. Yeah, so in I was going to of- say why is that, but you've already kind of explained that. But like it's to to hear how the the mechanics of that song like touched had like touched po- touch points from like from Scarface and from Stevie Wonder and from like mm-hmm. and 
the movie and Hollywood, like from the movie, because it comes from a movie soundtrack, and mm-hmm. like like how how it pulls all of those pieces <laughs> together. It's not a classic hip hop song in in the way you would think of uh, as some of the ones you just named earlier, but it's 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 one that really successfully touches a lot of points and because it touches all of those points that's why it became such a huge hit for everybody and it's a great i mean you know this as a grown man it's easy for things for, to fall apart and hard to pull them together and so that's what i mean i can appreciate the orchestration of just this song differently mm-hmm. than i could at 14 because i didn't understand things about business and life and how easily things fall apart as opposed to coming together this is a lot of things interwoven intricately that come together nicely and and quite frankly usually when that happens in music well it doesn't have to be all that lyrical now does it right right and so that's why i'm like oh no 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 the grown-up in me like can see how it works and uh and where it works and why it works and appreciate it and respect it on a totally different level enough that i feel comfortable enough to like spend the whole episode like or at least half the episode covering what the song means and unpacking some of the pieces and the um components to it so yeah. and, and the green day song actually to come full circle like it's another song that the lyrics, I don't say they don't matter, but like they, like you and I have both, we, we have said in this episode, we both listened to the song for 20 years and didn't know the words to it or not many of them anyway. So like, and, but it, it is a song that like carries the message forth of the, the energy, the melody, the whatever, like it carries that forth even without knowing the words to it really. It does. I mean, in the, I mean, in the, music is supposed to speak to your soul too, and it doesn't always need words to do it. If so, jazz wouldn't there be no need for jazz if that was the case? Jazz makes you feel without a word, so it's like it's possible mm-hmm. for Green Day to make a song that makes you feel without you knowing the words for twenty years, and it can also be in depth enough to offer a perspective to do a show on twenty years yeah. later, unbeknownst to you until you pick the song. Mm-hmm. You know, so so that's. It's one of those beautiful things about music. That's what I mean when I was like, when I actually saw the lyrics to this song and then thought about what the song is melody-wise and then opposed to this one, I'm like, well, this is the song with the complicated lyrics, but it unpacks a piece of uh, socioeconomics and culture and society in terms of the disparity Mm -hmm. of it. And I'm like, oh, this is one of our best pairings, actually, because of those things. So maybe not the best songs, Mm -hmm. but arguably one of our best pairings, in my opinion, uh, because of that. So Yeah, because they're taking the the same world and they're coming at it from two different directions. And we're, we're seeing like that world being narrated by two different people with very different life experiences. And, yeah. And it's funny, the gritty perspective is coming from the white kid who's left home. Yeah. Cause you know, the other guy, like I said, is numb to it, inundated. You know what I mean? Yeah. 